This is KPEN FM for all of the San Francisco Bay Area and proud to be Northern California's most listened to FM station, according to Western Union Survey. Time now for tonight's 10 o'clock KPEN test tone to be 40 cycles in just 60 seconds. One of the most spectacular demonstration albums of all times is now available on pre-recorded four-track tape. And for this week only, at half price of just $3.50. A Journey into Stereo Sound, a London recording, features 17 selections including trains, racing cars, and orchestral music in dynamic stereo. The special price of $3.50 is actually $1.50 less than the nationally advertised price of the stereo disc. And on four-track stereo tape, you get the quality of master recording fidelity. This is a one-week offer only, so stop in today, tomorrow, or phone your order for this outstanding tape, now on sale at Walter Willie's, 691 Market Street, downtown San Francisco, just next to the Examiner Building. That was the 10 o'clock KPEN test tone, 40 cycles. Our next test tone tonight at the hour of 11 o'clock will be 500 cycles. Test tones are heard each night, Sunday through Friday at 8, 9, 10, and 11 p.m. on KPEN. Thank you very much. It's a pleasure, pleasure to be here. I've heard about this group for longer than I can remember. Never really took an active interest in it, but now the more I've heard about it, the more I can see what a wonderful job you fellows do. Uh, I've been involved in other small groups like accordion groups, things like this. They have the worst time raising money. They have the worst time getting people together. They have the worst time keeping from fighting with each other. And uh, it's well, we just, do all that. oh, you do? Well, I did. it was a good show <laughs> today then, gentlemen. It was, a good, it was a good show today. Um, how I got here was well, so I got here in 1957 is when KPEN, which did do most of you know what KPEN was? No. No. Nope. Okay. Um, two two students, uh, one by the name of James Gabbard, who many of you would would know that name, yep. and myself were going to Stanford. And we were going to graduate, and we wanted to go into the radio business. And we went up to the FCC in San Francisco and said, how do you get an F AM station? Nobody wanted FM. We wanted an AM station. He said, well, boys, uh, you're 21 years old, and AM is way up here with the big leagues. You're in the wrong league. And this is a true story. The uh, Nay Landry was the chief of the bureau of the FCC in San Francisco, said, this is true. There are seven or eight channels lying around San Francisco on the FM band. Would you like one of them? I can't promise it to you, but you can apply, and you've got a pretty good chance of getting it. FM, the forgotten medium. <laughs> Nobody listened to FM radio. What do we want an FM station? Really, truly, n hardly a KPFA was probably the shining light in this area. Others, KELW as well. But nobody really was listening to FM. But we said, well, what do you, well, wait a minute, but it's an FM station in San Francisco versus an FM, versus an AM station in Timbuktu, God knows where. And uh, let's go for it. We applied for the license of KPEN in March of 1957. We were granted the license in June of 1957. Licenses don't go through that fast, but nobody wanted the channel or any of the channels. And we went on the air October 27th, 1957. So there at the beginning, there was just Jim and there was just me, literally. Two people running a radio station for a while, 24 hours a day. Don't ask how we did that. And did all the time sales, all the engineering, all the programming. We didn't have any money. We were two kids who had no money but wanted to have a radio station. So we did find one third partner who owned a piece of land up on Skyline Boulevard called Kings Mountain. And up on Kings Mountain, there was 
nothing but bare land and a reasonably, if not great, reasonably good antenna site. John also owned, he was a little eccentric, he was eccentric, he was, but he was wonderful, owned a 120-year-old adobe building located in Atherton, which he had bought without owning the land. He just bought the building, didn't know what to do with it. And he said, hey, you guys have got a pretty neat idea here with this radio station. Maybe I'll join you, and let's get together. We'll have a partnership. We'll put the adobe up on the top of the hill, and we'll run a radio station. So this was the start of KPEN, and that's why I'm here today. That was my beginning in radio. That was Jim's beginning in radio. That was John Wickett's beginning in radio. And we started out with nothing. Literally, we put the station on the air for $11,000. Most it was it was more than it is now. Yeah. <laughs> About three <automobiles>, yeah. <laughs> yeah. But we put it on for that amount of money, and uh, from there the history followed, and we we got two advertisers. Each one spent four hundred dollars a month. Davy Chevrolet in Redwood City, Alco Paramount High Fidelity in San Jose. And our overhead was $900 a month. So we just made it. When we were eating on 29 cent TV dinners, this was Jim's and my. John was sort of over here playing with his adobe and his other building. He was not that involved. So basically, it's a story of, uh, of Jim Gabbard and myself. And um, we grew. We knew we were not on the best antenna site, that either Bruno or Sutro would be better. We knew we had no offices down in the business community. Our offices were up on a mountaintop. We had to do something here if we're really going to grow. So we got our offices down to Menlo Park, and we started talking to the people at Bruno primarily as a place to go and have our antenna located. When we were up on Kings Mountain, we were 1,500 watts, 1,500 watts, which is not a lot of power. That's all we could afford. When we went to Bruno, we finally had a power of 35,000 watts. We could afford that. We could then get into San Francisco. Kings Mountain was here. Skyline Boulevard was here. Skyline Boulevard and Bruno itself were blocking San Francisco from our coverage. So we needed to get into San Francisco. So we had to go on to, to San Bruno Mountain. And that's where we went. And from there, uh, now we had, then we also knew, as we were getting publicity nationally, where, from people in New York, you're, okay, back up, we were licensed to Atherton, California. That's where John Wickett's real estate office was, that's the address we used, and that is the address that we were using as we went on the air. This is KPEN, Atherton, California. Now, people in New York, as we were getting more publicity and more interested in us, and seeing that we started to get a little tick of a rating, where's, where is Atherton? So we needed to be in San Francisco. So we then, we had moved once from the top of the hill down into some, a building in Menlo Park, which had offices, and then we moved to San Francisco. All of this took place in about two years. These three moves, these transmitter moves, the whole thing took place in this very short period of time. But we were now in San Francisco. We were getting ratings. We were starting to show. People were looking at us as a viable alternative. There was more than, God bless their great souls, there was more than KSFO. And there was more than KNBR. And there was more than KGO. FM was coming along. There was KPEN, and there was others. There were KSFR and other stations who were doing FM broadcasting at that time. Let's face it, FM came along and took over. You know, FM was the, is, was the side of the broadcast link that the man in the FCC office said, nobody wants an FM station. Everybody wants an AM station. And that was true, but that changed. And because of a lot of the stuff that I think we did and a lot of stuff the other stations did, it happened. The biggest thing that happened that we did that really made the station and really made FM 
and put FM in the cat dog seat for broadcasting of oral broadcasting was FM stereo. Stereo was the one that, that really caught on. Uh, there was a gentleman here by the name of Will Remit. I don't know if he just left. He used to make, he's still here, still here. Used to make, there you are, Will, used to make receivers for the uh, early day FM broadcasting. Scott Fisher, names that are now forgotten. We're making receivers to pick up our early multiplex. Uh, lots of their stuff in this very building. Do you, I, I see that Scott sitting down there. That Scott Tuner, you know, as you walk in the door, I said, wow. I remember that. Mm. That was a great tuner. So, uh, so anyway, we FM multiplex stereo made KPEN, KPEN, and uh, we started to get more and more uh, listeners. We started to get more and more advertisers. People were coming to us at nighttime on KPEN from six until six thirty. It was now brought to you by Bank of America. 6.30 to 7 was brought to you by, forgive me, a capable, similar to uh, Bank of America. 7 to 8 was the Cadillac Hour. An hour on, on radio brought to you by Cadillac. Of course, that even to itself speaks to another era. You wouldn't have anything like that today. KPN's programming was basically, during the daytime, playing... FM had been looked at as a classical medium, generally, classical and educational. We decided there was a bigger audience than that. So at the very beginning, we'd started doing quality popular music. By that, I mean Peggy Lee, uh, Doris Day, uh, Frank Sinatra, uh, people who were known to be musicians. In a time when a lot of adults thought rock and roll was the dregs, was absolutely the bottom. I don't want that music in my house. Kids, turn it off. I'm going to listen to KPEN because that's what they're playing during the daytime. Then into nighttime, we went into classical music. And so we had a diverse programming uh, of popular in the, in the daytime, classical in the evening, and uh, then excursions in stereo and excursions in sound. Very famous program because Jim did that for a number of years, featuring such great things as locomotives running through your living room <laughs> and those kind of things that were really made for stereo, you know, really made for stereo. So we were doing all that sort of stuff. And, uh, and it was interesting. It was creative. We did a stereo broadcast of War of the Worlds, which we yeah, were talking that was, about. That was excellent. If you ever had a chance, some people have tapes of it. If you want to hear War of the Worlds, produced by KPEN in stereo, give a listen to it. It's really, really, it was good. It was good. So um, the problem with KPEN, for all it had done, and all it should be remembered for, and because AM was still KSFO, KFRC, KNBR, KGO, and FM was somewhere down here. Sometimes still is forgotten. It needs to be remembered. It was really major in what happened to broadcasting. And that was the switch from AM to FM. So um, we, what happened, what, what really happened is times passed, however. The uh, things that were Music that was no longer, that was once upon a time not acceptable in the home of many of us. We didn't want to hear Elvis Presley. Hard to believe. Think back. You didn't. You didn't want to hear uh, the Ronettes. You didn't want to hear all of that stuff. You want to hear really good music. And what happened, but the population didn't necessarily agree. More and more people wanted to hear Elvis Presley and Pat Boone and so forth and so on. So KPEN found itself in a hard place, either continue along this what had been a most productive path of um, doing good music, good popular music, quality music, never running more than six commercials an hour, never, never running a singing commercial. 
that was the history and the quality of KPEN. And, but that was only going so far because there was just a lot of KSAN was coming along, uh, more and more rock was coming along, more and more people were listening to rock. Our ratings were slipping. And uh, it was probably, at least it was, it was time to change to a more progressive, more modern, more, some of us would say, um, not as good. Uh, sadder than something like as good as KPEN passed. But times do pass. And uh, Joni Mitchell says, some things has to go, Tom. The uh, day each, each day, each, every day, something's gained and something's lost, and that's what happened with KPEN. It eventually, like all the stations on the band today, KSFO is not KSFO, obviously. The uh, KNBR is not KNBR. KFRC is not KFRC. You know, they're just all gone. So KPEN had its day, it had its moment, and it went. And the reason I'm really here <laughs> is to talk about this for lunch, and it's Steve's great invitation to be here. And Len Shapiro, who I met at the, at the Broadcast Legends Luncheon, said, you've got to get involved. Come on down. See the museum. Steve will show it to you. Steve spent about two hours showing me this museum. This leads somewhere. I had been writing over about the last six months a book about KPEN. I basically have just told you the story. But it is what KPEN was about, what KPEN attempted to do, and what KPEN achieved. And um, I, so the book is being finished. This is deja vu. I mean, this is wonderful. The, the book is being finished, and I run into Len and Steve. And um, I said, I don't know what to do with my book. You know, they said, well, we've got a, got a home for it. We'll, we'll, we'll take it here. So uh, I've, the copies are at the press right now. They'll be available on Tuesday. And Steve and Lynn and I decided I'd like to make a contribution to CHRS in the form of whatever money comes in from these books goes 100% to the fund to what you're all trying to do and what you've been talking about. Thank you. It's the best way I can give back for all that radio gave to me a long time ago. You're here today carrying on the battle for good radio and good broadcasting and, and the memory of what was broadcasting. And that's very important in itself because that should not be forgotten. Doc Harrell should not be forgotten. Uh, people that we could name that are historic in this area and in other areas. And uh, it's just an important thing that it be continued. So you'll have your books, Len, and you'll have your books, Steve, in a little while. And we hope you enjoy them. My friend Tom Champs here today did most of the graphics on the book. I think it is an attractive publication. And it will tell you the story of what I've just told you in more detail about what was KPEN what was going on at that time with AM radio, with FM radio. It is, it's, it's 54 pages. You can read it in a short time. But uh, it's why I'm happy to be here today for more reasons than one. And uh, Steve, thank you so much. Lynn, thank you so much. And if any of you has any questions about KPEN or anything, I'd be happy to answer them. Yes. Does the book go into detail about the, uh, the stereo and the invention of multiplex and all that? Oh. That chapter is called Stereo, exclamation mark. It, absolutely, absolutely, yes. Because that was, that was the really big thing. Yes. Is Jim still alive? Oh, yeah, sure. He lives in Sausalito. Oh, okay. We're both the same age. He had coffee, right? He had, he had coffee. He had the TV station. I left the, after, <clears throat> excuse me, after KPEN changed, to me, it wasn't KPEN. It was time to leave the business. And I left the business and moved to the Napa Valley where I have a, have a vineyard to this day. And Jim wanted to stick it out with radio. He was going to 
make ratings if he, quote unquote, had to play Chinese 45s backwards at 33 RPM. <laughs> That said the devil. <laughs> <laughs> and it happened. Yes. Maybe a dumb question, but I live up in Grass Valley, Nevada City area. Mm -hmm. Does KPEN still exist? KPEN became K101. I should have mentioned that. It was still under Jim's uh, and John Wickett's ownership. I left. And then... As in the case with radio, it's gone through I don't know how many owners. It's now called Star 101.3. Uh, it's still at 101.3. It's still at the same power, which finally got up to 120,000 watts. And uh, FM license that big. Beg pardon? <coughs> you get an FM license. Well, grandfather. Grandfather. Oh, it, it, two things. One, it was grandfathered, yeah. and two, we did a little trick that the FCC approved, of course. Uh, we did directional antenna. The, uh, the average could not be greater than, I forgot what the average could be, but yeah. you could, but we were putting half of it out to sea anyway. Yeah. So we pushed it all inland and gave 120,000 watts inland mm -hmm. while sea was getting nothing, so mm -hmm. there was nothing out there. Okay. So that's what happened there. What year did you become K101? 1968. 68. Right. Later than I thought. Yeah, 68. It was, uh, I don't know, it was December of 68. It was October 20, 27th of 1957 to uh, de December of 68. 11 years. And, and 1968 yeah. was where one of our stories ends and where one of our, one, our, is where our case end story begins. So we have a sort of seamless transition. You our, do. The two big stories we're telling recently. Yeah. You do, Steve, yeah. because K KSAN was part of KPN's got to change. You know, things are, times they are changing, and which is another chapter name in the book. And... Uh, and, excuse me, hand up? Oh, yeah. The, the idea behind the call sign change was just to create a new identity. Basically. Yeah, yeah, yeah. KPEN, I didn't, there's so many things I didn't mention that they're all in the book. I sound like somebody on TV. I didn't mention it, but you buy the book, it's, yeah, yeah, yeah. it's in the book. The, uh, what was it? What, Everybody which, should buy the KPEN. The KPEN stood for, because we started down in the peninsula, peninsula. And after a while, it was really no longer meaningful to the, what the station was. Yeah. You have to mention to the source material that you had someone that uh, kept pretty good track of your history, of, of your work in radio. Your, your Thank you. <laughs> Thank you very much. The, uh, those of you who read the book and buy the book will see that it is dedicated to my mother who kept a scrapbook of everything that ever happened to KPEN. And you will read things in there. Thank you so much, Len, for mentioning that. The, uh, and the book is dedicated to her and to her memory. And columns from Terrence O'Flaherty, columns from Dwight Newton, columns from Bob Foster, uh, <coughs> pictures of the adobe up on the hill, pictures of the Finally, elegant studio that we ended up up in on Knob Hill. Those of you remember that. The uh, uh, it's 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 as complete as I can make it, and not bore everybody with more detail than I needed to do. But uh, if it wasn't for my mother, there wouldn't have been a book, and there couldn't have been a book. And you know, gentlemen, Len, you know we haven't even put a price on the price on this book. No, yeah. Is it a hardback or a softback? It's a it's soft. softback. It's a yeah. softback. Yeah. It's a large for what they call a trade edition, so it's a largish. Yeah. Yes, it's eight and a half by eleven. They call those oh, trade yeah. editions. Yeah, trade softbacks, editions. Yeah. It's a trade we edition. We haven't, but probably we're thinking somewhere around twenty bucks. Whatever. It's, it's your book, gentlemen. Just just so to, you know, it will. Uh, to put this out here. For right now, it's only going to be available in the glass case in front. But this week, we will start. We will start uh, our process of setting up a fulfillment uh, guy who will be selling the books, and then you'll be able to get them online through our site. But for now, if you want one in the next couple of weeks, get them from the front log from the front uh, here. 
Yeah. We'll be selling them on Wednesday at the luncheon. That's yes. Wednesday at the luncheon. Wednesday, will they be selling them Wednesday at the luncheon? I, I hope. Len? I, th I think so. I don't see sure. why not. Sure. Well, why not, Len? I don't mean, see why not. We couldn't sell books on Wednesday. Yeah. Yeah. They'll be. They come off the printer on Tuesday. <laughs> Your Steve, not to not to I'm cut right out there. CHRS, but we, I told the printer that we have to have them for the tenth because that was your luncheon date. Yeah. He said, okay, I'll do it on the 9th. So that's how it's, they're coming off. Yeah. Sounds good. I'll bring it down. Any questions for Gary? I, got, I have one. Any relationship with KCEA out of Menlo Atherton today? Out of Menlo Atherton today, don't even know what the station KCEA is. KCEA, for those that don't know, is all big band all the time. Really? It's a high school Oh, it's a high school station? Yeah. I wouldn't know it, yeah. but it, that's yeah. probably... Absolutely uh, correct. 89.1, I think. Yeah. Oh. There was a station that went on the air after, when, we, when it was still a KPEN, went on the air as KPGM in uh, Los, Altos. Los Altos. Len knows that one. 97.7. Uh, and they later changed their call letter after enough time had passed to KPEN. I think they're still KPEN? No. KQ, KQ, something like KQATT. Okay. Can it be that it was all so simple then? You know? <laughs> we knew the stations. We knew the Don Sherwoods. We knew the people who were on the, all the uh, we knew the Carter Smiths. We knew all the people that were on these stations. And now, I, I couldn't name half of the call letters. I just, like up in the wine country, I can no longer name half the wineries. Or it, I, there's just so many of them. Any other questions for Gary? Well, we just at this point we want to thank him very, very much. So thank you for uh, for his thoughts and his membership and his wonderful donation to CHRS.